Hey, we're teaching on Christian philosophy. This will be our third lesson in that series. Uh, just to refresh your memory, I was using Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, where it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And I was sharing that this is really the root cause. This is a follow-up of the very first thing we taught in here about the integrity of the Word, about how you got to plant the Word in your heart, how that the kingdom of God operates like a seed, and the Word is the seed in the spiritual realm. And uh, so it's not just individual thoughts, but it's a way of thinking, a philosophy, a paradigm, a worldview, uh, your attitude towards life. And we've spent two lessons talking about that. One verse that I don't remember emphasizing, and if I did, it needs to be emphasized again, because to me, this is one of the most important things. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 15, talking about Abraham and Sarah, it says that if they truly, if they had been mindful of the country that they came out of, they might have had opportunity to return. Did I emphasize that in here? <laughs> There's somebody shaking their head no, the other one right beside them shaking their head yes. So it uh, makes you wonder what we were listening to. But anyway, let me just quickly say this, that what this verse is saying for Abraham and Sarah, going back to Ur of the Chaldees would have been unbelief. And so you can link their unbelief to what they thought. Or you could say it this way, temptation is linked to what you think. If you don't think on it, you can't do it. I got two Bibles. What a deal. <laughs> I like this one better. If you can't think it, you can't do it. And so the way that you control temptation in your life is you control what you think. And it fits perfectly with uh, what I'm teaching about Christian philosophy, that if we would get a Christian philosophy, a Christian paradigm, worldview, way of thinking. And if we thought that way, Satan would lose inroads into our life. And sad to say, most Christians today are very plugged into our world, our secular world. We have all of their news, all of their magazines, their information just bombarding us day and night. Uh, we have an entire generation that have been raised to think that you can't have any quiet you got to have something going all of the time. And man, it's usually secular, ungodly stuff. And it just bombards us and it opens us to temptation. One of the great things about Abraham that made him a great man of God was that he didn't have CNN and all of this stuff. And that really makes a difference. It really does. That stuff hardens our heart towards God. So praise God, we've got to keep our minds stayed upon the Lord. And that's what we've been talking about. Let's turn back over to uh, Genesis chapter 3, and I want to show this to you in the temptation of Adam and Eve. And if I remember correctly, I've already covered part of this. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent didn't choose. The strongest animal, the biggest animal, or the, um, the most intimidating animal... But instead, what he did was choose the most crafty animal because Satan has no power to make us do anything. The devil couldn't force Adam and Eve into obedience. What he had to do was get into their thinking and get them to change the way that they were thinking about things. Sin starts in your mind. It starts in your emotions. That is a powerful statement right there. I've got a great teaching on harnessing your emotions that I'll be dealing with at the end of this year that fits perfectly right here. And most people don't understand this. They just let their emotions run wild. They let their mind think on anything. They'll let the sewage of the world flow through their mind and then wonder why is it that I'm having such a hard time believing God. Your actions and emotions are linked directly to what you think on. So you need to control your thinking and specifically you need to have a Christian philosophy, a Christian way of thinking and you just don't do things contrary to that. And again, we, we, many people have been outside of the Lord and many of the attitudes that you've adopted as foundational, many of you have just embraced that this is the way my family has been. We're all uh, 
type A personalities and you've just embraced whatever and this is a part of your personality and you've never submitted it to the Lord. And because of it, it's impossible but what that you can respond in anger or hurt or bitterness or whatever because that's the way that you're programmed. It's like a default programming on a computer or something. And so anyway, you've got to go back and you've got to rechange uh, change all of this thinking. So the way that Satan came against Adam and Eve was through their thinking. And you see this here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now the very first thing that the serpent did was attack what God said. Attack the Word of God. Did you know if you just stuck with what God said, if every one of our values and opinions were based on what the Word of God said, do you know what? Satan would be through in our life. Satan has to attack that. And again, most of us have formed values and attitudes, personality decisions based on everything but the Word of God. We've got to go back and change the way that we think. We've got to get a Christian philosophy, a Christian way of thinking. Many of you were taught that, you know what, you just getting angry is just part of life. That's what you were raised with. I remember that there was this one guy in one of my churches, and anyway, long, long story, but he and his wife got born again miraculously, and they became into our church in Childers, Texas, and it was good, but he just started sowing strife and discord. He criticized everything that people did. If you peeled your potatoes, he got on you because that was the most nutritious part of the whole potato and you should eat it. And he would just go in and criticize people. He didn't like soap. That wasn't natural. And it was obvious he didn't like soap. <laughs> he wouldn't use any deodorant. And it just everything about, he just had an attitude. And anyway, after a few months of being in our church, he came over to my house and he says, I'm leaving. I'm going back into the wilderness. You're a bunch of hypocrites and there's just strife in this church. And I said, you're right, there is strife in this church and they're the source of all of it. I said, we didn't have any strife until you came here and went to criticizing everybody. And I said, you, you just stirred the pot and you made everybody mad. And I just started telling him, I said, you're the source of all of it. And I didn't know what this guy was gonna do. And he just looked at me and he says, I don't know how to be any else, anything else. And he had only been born again a couple of months. And he says, if you were telling me to act healed, I could do that because I felt well before. If you were telling me to uh, act like I had money, I could do that because I've had money. But he says, I've never felt love. This guy was the first person indicted by the California grand jury three times before he was 13 years old. He grew up in reformatories and stuff. And he says, I've never felt loved. I don't know what being normal is. And it just dawned on me that this guy honestly the way he was living, he just being critical and griping and complaining and so in discord. This is the way he had lived his entire life. It was his philosophy. It was his paradigm. And when I told him that he needed to walk in love, he didn't know what love was. There's probably people sitting right here that you grew up in what you considered norm, the way that you think your philosophy and attitude towards life is skewed because of your background. You just grew up with strife. You grew up with people yelling at each other. You grew up with uh, people treating each other badly and you just think that that's the way it is. Man, that's wrong. You know, we were going up to Denver um, Sunday and went to, uh, took our granddaughter and two boys to the um, circus up there. And we went up there and anyway, I forgot how we got to talking about something, but we got to talking about marriage. And somebody on the radio, I think it was, said something about marriage, about, oh, we were watching a, a video as I drove up there is what it was, and it was the uh, Ample Dumpling Gang. If any of what it was, and it was the uh, Ample Dumpling Gang. If any of you ever remember that. And anyway, yeah, Don Nons and Dusty and Donovan got married, and within 10 minutes, she was having a fight, and she hit him with the spittoon and everything, and they asked, what happened to them? He says, oh, they got married. <laughs> And they were making a joke about this is just the way that marriage is. And uh, anyway, my son said something about, boy, that's the way marriage is, isn't it? Because he's been through a bad marriage. And I said, no, it's not. I said, it's not that way. And he looked and he says, well, your marriage is the way it's supposed to be, but you are in the minority. And anyway, we got to discuss it. But 
My point is that, see, a lot of people have just been raised to think that marriage is supposed to be where you fight and you have all of these problems, and they think that this is natural. If that's what you think, then you know what? You're going to give yourself over to all of this strife and all of these kind of things. And there's people that just think this is the way it's supposed to be. You've got to change that thinking and have a Christian philosophy, a Christian way of thinking, a Christian worldview, and recognize it doesn't matter what you were brought up in and whether they yelled at each other and did things, and if it was selfish, it doesn't matter. We are born again, and we've got to change the way that we think. Trying to change your action without changing the way you think is just an exercise in futility. We've got to act on the Word of God. So, before Satan could get Adam and Eve to do anything wrong, he had to, first of all, come against the standard that had been given them, the Word of God, and he had to attack it. Has God really said... And I can guarantee you, before you can enter into any failure in your life, any sin, before Satan can gain an inroad into your life, he's got to get at the way you think, your philosophy, your worldview. Boy, that's powerful. And that's the precise reason that we're all in school. That's the reason that you're here is to renew our mind and to make adjustments in the way we think. And as you do it, well, then as a man thinks in his heart, that's the way that he is. So he attacked the Word of God. You know what Adam and Eve's reaction should have been? They should have right there said, that's it. Man, God said it. It's not for me to question why he said it. Man, God is a good God. And if God told us to do something, he's just smarter than you are. And you ought to just submit to it and say, I don't have to understand it. You know, your brain can get in the way of you responding to God. I'm not saying that true Christianity is senseless and that it doesn't make sense, but I am saying that you can sit there and, and listen to questions. Basically, Satan began to say, oh yeah, God said that, but here's why he said it. And he began to start questioning the goodness of God. Let me make sure I get this in the right order. I'm always teaching things differently. All right, so... If, here's, a, here's a radical statement. Some of you will be surprised at this. But Adam and Eve didn't really know God. And some people think, well, what are you saying? Adam and Eve were perfect. They were sinless. Of course they knew God. They walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening. But let me just present to you that through the Word of God, we can know God, have a greater revelation of who He is than Adam and Eve had. We do not fully appreciate how much God has revealed himself and his nature to us through the word of God. If Adam and Eve, I don't believe, ever had a concept that God loved them so much that he would literally become a man. He would leave heaven and become a man and suffer all of the things that that meant, being limited to a physical body and then eventually die and take our sins and our punishment for us. Adam and Eve never knew God that way. Now, God had never done anything wrong to them. I believe he created a perfect environment, gave them everything, gave them the perfect mate, just did everything, <laughs> amen. Did you ever hear the story about God coming to Adam and saying, Adam, I'm going to cre create you a helpmate that is perfect. She'll never gripe. She'll never complain. She will love you. She'll cook. She'll clean house. Everything will be perfect. I mean, I'm going to give you a perfect mate. And Adam said, what's this going to cost me? <laughs> God said, an arm and a leg. And he said, what could you give me for a rib? <laughs> oh, well. <clears throat> But anyway, God, just, he had been good to Adam and Eve. There was no reason for them to doubt him, but they did not know by experience what you and I know about God. You can know God better than Adam and Eve knew God through the Word. This is a perfect revelation of him. And so in a sense, you could nearly excuse Adam and Eve because they didn't understand what you and I have the ability to understand. And we could take the revelation of this word and renew our mind, and we could come to know God in a way that Satan could not misrepresent him. But you know, there's just all kinds of things that happen in life 
that tend to come against what the Word of God has to say. You know, for instance, many of you didn't know uh, Cindy Campbell, but we're doing a memorial service for her today. She was a Bible college student, and she died. She was our very first employee that I ever had back, I don't know, in 1980-something. And um, anyway, she died. We're doing a memorial service. And you know what? I laid hands on her. She was in my office, and her stomach was swollen from cancer. And I asked her if I could lay hands on her, and she said yes. And I laid hands on her, and that tumor shrunk right in front of my eyes. Donna Priest was in there with me, and you can ask. I mean, that tumor just went like that, and it was gone. And yet, in a few months later, uh, it came back. She died of cancer. You know what? I don't understand everything. And circumstances like that tend to make you think that, well, maybe God isn't a good God that wants to heal every single person. But I can guarantee you that that is not true. I have just learned that God is a good God. There are reasons why things happen. I've learned a lot of reasons, but I still don't understand it all. You know, this takes me all the way back to the very beginning of my walk with the Lord that I had a girl, uh, Jamie's best friend, and this girl that we were believing God to heal, and she died. And we stood around for over two hours after she died and believed God to raise her from the dead. And she wasn't raised from the dead. At her funeral, we saw four people born again. And uh, you know what? Every person associated with that situation, basically because we gave it our all and because we did everything we knew to do and didn't see this girl heal, everybody just basically said, well, it must not be God's will to heal. And they rejected it and they went a different path. And I remember saying, no, God did not kill this girl. I know God didn't do that. I know God. God is a good God. God wills for good things. He wants us to be well above all things. He wants us to prosper and be in health. And I didn't understand why she died. But you know what? I just stood on the Word of God, what I did not know, and I said, I refuse to sit there and criticize God just so that I can have an explanation, put this in a box and file it away so that I don't have to deal with it. And it took me over three years to begin to understand why she wasn't healed. But man, when the Lord began to reveal the Word to me and show me things, we did everything wrong that you could do. There's reasons why that girl wasn't healed, why she died at a young age. And you know what? This is basically the problem right here. Satan began to come against the very nature of God and begin to say, here's why God told you not to eat of this tree, is because God really isn't a good God. God is holding something back, and begin to start criticizing the very nature and the character of God. If Adam and Eve would have known God more intimately, and again, I'm not trying to criticize them because they, they didn't have the revelation of Jesus. God hadn't become flesh. He hadn't proven himself. They didn't have the benefit of history and seeing what had happened over and over and over and over and over again. But I'm saying if they would have known God better, you know, they could have stopped this entire uh, temptation right here, and that would have been the end of it if they would have just had an intimate relationship with God and known that God is a good God. You know, even in, from their perspective, God had given them a perfect environment, Man, it was awesome. The food was perfect. Everything was perfect. There wasn't any problems. God had created a perfect world, and there was only one thing in the entire universe that God told them not to do. And I believe that the only reason that existed was so that they could have a choice. God didn't want to just dictate and force them to obey Him. So He gave them a choice. Man, he had been good to them, and yet they focused on the one thing that they didn't have. Don't ever let what you don't know affect what you do know. The, the proof in the Word of God is so powerful that God is a good God, and that God loves us, and that God wants to bless us. Man, don't let circumstances... There's going to be things that we don't understand. Like I was saying about Cindy Campbell, I don't understand totally everything that happened. I think I've got some revelation on it, but you know what? I'm more than close enough to it. I just don't know the whole situation. But I'm not going to let what I don't know overwhelm what I do know. I know God is a good God. Amen. I have seen God just 
do miracles and transform people's lives. I know from the Word of God that He is good. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. I have seen God through Jesus, and Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. They weren't oppressed of God. They were oppressed of the devil. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And He healed them all. It's God's will for us to be prosperous and well above all things. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. And I know what the Word of God says. And you know what? I just refuse to let a negative experience or something that I don't understand overwhelm what I do understand. Amen? And because of that, I believe that Satan isn't able to penetrate once you understand and know the very nature of God. It just changes things. You know, this experience I had with the Lord, Lord on March 23rd, 1968, I just knew that God was a good God, and I knew that His goodness had zero to do with me because He had just shown me what a religious hypocrite I was, and He had shown me all of my ungodliness, and for the first time in my life, I finally became aware that I had no goodness, nothing to stand on based on my own goodness, and yet I experienced an overwhelming love of God, and I knew from that that God's love was not based on what I do. And because of that, I came to know God. I came to know that God is a good God that's not basing His love for me on my goodness. He loves me because He is love, not because I am lovely. And I came to know God that way. And you know what? I've had a lot of things happen, just like all of you have. I mean, life, well, we live in a fallen world and there's bad things that happen. And if you aren't careful, you will let external things, like a talking snake, talk you out of the goodness of God. But man, you have to come to know God. You need to have a personal relationship with God. I'm reminded in Vietnam that I was doing a Bible study and I had about six or seven people in this Bible study and I had an atheist walk into that Bible study and he was a Princeton graduate and he listened for just a few minutes and then he began to start picking apart everything I said and just ridiculing me and making fun of me. And he, uh, he just made a fool out of me. I didn't know the word very well and he just, he just ridiculed me. And anyway, it was so bad, he's, he got up and he said, oh, let's leave. And he took every one of the people in my Bible study and they left. And they all went with the atheist. Didn't look very good. And I was just sitting there, I was in the chapel and I was sitting there praying and saying, God, what, what was wrong? You know, what could I have done better? And I was praying and asking the Lord for help. And in about 20 minutes, this atheist walks back in and sits down. It was a library in the chapel and he acted like he was reading a book or something. And after there was another person in there and after they left, this atheist came over to me and he says, I want what you've got. And I said, you do? Like, <laughs> like uh, why would you want what I've got? You just made a fool of me. And he said, my whole life is based on an argument. He says, it's all intellectual. And he says, I out-argued you and made you look stupid. And yet you still believe. You still, you've got something that is bigger than an argument. He says, you know God in a way that I want to know God. And he asked me to lead him to the Lord. So I prayed with him for salvation. And you know what? This is really what Christianity is all about. I'm not saying that we don't use our mind, but it's a heart-to-heart -heart deal. It's on a heart level that you come to know God. You can have a relationship with God that you just know Him, that He's a good God. And you know, like this example that I gave you, I didn't understand why this girl died and everybody else. I even remember one person coming and saying, so you're saying that God doesn't control everything. And back at that time, I, you know, we were taught the sovereignty of God and that every single thing that happens, it's God's decision. And I didn't understand it. I didn't know how to tell him. I said, I don't know what I'm telling you. I'm just telling you God didn't kill this girl. That is not God's will. I know God and God didn't do that. And you know what? It took me a long time to figure it out. But the way that I knew God kept me from yielding to the doubt and the unbelief and the things that caused other people to get off track. And I'm saying that this is the way we've got to know God. So 
one of the Christian philosophies that you need to have. You need to get to know God. You need to get to know that God is a good God. If it's good, it's from God. If it's bad, it's from the devil. That is really simple theology, but that ought to be a part of your Christian philosophy. It says over in James chapter 1 that every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. That's an old English way of saying that it never fluctuates. This is who God is. Let me just read this to you. You need to get this as one of the kingpins of your philosophy. Out of James. Chapter 1. Let's start reading with verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin when it is finished brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness nor neither shadow of turning. That's just an old English way of saying it never changes. This is the nature of God. God is a good God. If it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's the devil. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief come, cometh not but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. If it's thief, come, cometh not, but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. If it's stealing, if it's killing, stealing, if it's killing, if it's destroying, it's the devil. If it's good, it's God. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So you just need to get this down. If it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's the devil. That is so simple, but it's profound. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, it says that one of the signs of the end times is that people will call evil good and good evil. And did you know, sad to say, this is exactly what the church is doing. You don't have to just talk about the gay and lesbians calling homosexuality good and heterosexual evil. You don't have to go there. Go to the church. And the church is saying, no, God's the one that put this sickness on you. God's the one that causes these kind of things. It's either judgment or it's him making you holier or who knows whatever. And religion comes up with a million and one different answers for it. But I'm telling you, this is a philosophy that I have and I have stuck by it and I still don't see every single thing work. But you know what? I am seeing greater results than I've ever seen. It's like in the past, you have a thousand piece puzzle. And I had 10 pieces that used to fit and 990 that didn't. Now I've got 990 that fit and 10 that don't. I know I'm on the right track, amen. I'm not going to back up from this. I'm seeing the power of God manifest in people's lives change. But it's just a philosophy that I have that God is a good God. That Jesus said he represented the Father perfectly. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus never put sickness on a person. Jesus never went around and says, oh, I'm going to bless you and humble you and make you a better person. Here's cancer. <laughs> Jesus went around healing all that were oppressed of the devil. It's God's will for you to be well. It's God's will for you to prosper. It's God's will for you to succeed. God is not the one who's causing our problems. And basically, Adam and Eve gave in to this temptation in Genesis chapter 3 because they didn't really know God. They didn't know the nature and the character of God. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of Christians that are falling prey to the lies of the devil and are being uh, taken off track because they never have gotten to really know God. You get to know God through the Word of God. And the Word of God has given us a revelation of the Lord that Adam and Eve never had. You can know God better than perfect people living in sinless perfection through the Word of God. Man, that's awesome. Look over here in 2 Peter. In 
In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter is talking about that he knew he was in, nearing the end of his life. He says in verse 12, I'll not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, talking about in this body, to stir you up by putting you in way of remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. And that's the reason he wrote First and Second Peter. He put it down so that people, even after the eyewitness accounts of Jesus and his resurrection, after those people were gone, they'd be able to go back to the Word and they'd be able to constantly have these things in front of them. And then he says in verse um, 16, For you have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. What he's saying is, he says, the reason I'm going to write this down and tell you all of these things is because we were eyewitness accounts. We didn't just tell you a fable. This isn't something we made up. We saw it. We beheld the glory of God. They were on the mountain. When Jesus began to just radiate light, he didn't reflect it. It's like he pulled back somehow or another his body and just let the glory that had been on the inside of him all along out. They saw the glory of God shining out of Jesus. They saw a glory cloud, the Shekinah glory of God that used to inhabit the temple and that caused people to fall on their face. They saw this glory cloud come over and they heard an audible voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. They saw Moses and Elijah there talking with Jesus and <laughs> explaining things to him. Man, that's pretty powerful. And he's saying these things to say that, look, this isn't a fable. This isn't a story that we made up. This isn't something we got in a dream, you know, that was a result of eating pizza. <laughs> this is something we saw. Did you know most people would say, man, that's proof, because most people are really into all of these natural, physical things. I was talking to a man last night who had a tremendous experience with the Lord, and I mean for nearly a year, just caught up in an emotional walk with the Lord where he could feel the presence of God. And this guy for the last 23 years has been just on the verge of dying and his life is miserable. He was just sitting there crying. And you know what a lot of his problem is? That he became addicted to the emotional state that he was in and he doesn't go by faith in what the Word of God says that he has. He's wanting to get back into something where he can just feel the presence of God instead of walking by faith. And it's about to destroy him. And I got to ministering to him. You've got a wrong identity. You think that this physical, external you is the real you. You don't know who you are in Christ. And I got to ministering to him along those lines. And boy, this happens to a lot of people that they just are caught up in all of these external things. And so... Here's, here's uh, Peter saying, we saw the glory of God. We heard an audible voice. We had all of these physical things. Most people would say, man, that's it. That's proof. That's the ultimate proof. And yet look at what he said in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. What could be more sure than seeing Jesus radiate light? And having an audible voice and a glory cloud and seeing Moses and Elijah what can be more sure than that? In verse 20, it says, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. And basically, he's just saying that the thing that's more sure than all of these physical, tangible things is the written word of God, the prophecy of the scripture. Most people do not honor the word of God the way that they should. There's a lot of people that use the Bible only to, so they can get an experience so that they can have God touch them. And they'll study the Word hoping that God really does something external, something physical, natural that they can feel or see. And they just use the Word kind of like a springboard to get into something emotional or physical. But I'm telling you that this is the more sure word of prophecy. You can know God better through the Word of God than Adam and Eve did.
And you know, I don't say this in pride or arrogance, but I believe it based on the Word of God. I believe I know God better than Adam and Eve did. The Lord can't come to me and say, well, why didn't this happen? And it's because God isn't a good God because it's not God's will to do this. I've just learned that God is a good God and things happen that aren't God's will for multiple of reasons. And I don't always know what the reasons are, but I know this, God's a good God. I know God loves me. I know God only has good things planned for me. And if I experience something negative, it's not God's fault. And I don't blame God. And I don't get bitter at God. And I don't rebel at God's command because I didn't see something. If Adam and Eve would have really known God on a deeper level, you know what? They would not have submitted to this temptation. And so we're talking about a Christian philosophy. And this, I believe, is one of the most important things that you could just come to. You need to get to know God through the Word of God. You need to find out who He is. Moses said this over in Exodus chapter 33. He says, Oh Lord, show me your way that I might know you. And you got to remember, this is the man who had already seen the Lord at the burning bush, who had gone to Egypt and had done these ten miraculous plagues and had brought the children of Israel out and had split the Red Sea and had gotten the Ten Commandments, spent 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God and saw God right with His finger on that thing. And after all of that, He says, God, show me your way that I might know you. Most people would think He knew God pretty well. And yet, you know what? God is so infinite, you don't ever get to where you fully know and fully understand. Again, I have people all of the time come and say, well, why did this happen? If you've grown and if you've been seeking the Lord for 40 years, well, then how come this happened? How come you didn't know what was going on? Man, God is infinite and I'm finite. And you know what? I just don't know that we will ever totally get everything revealed to us. I believe that we can, but, um, you know, I'm starting at a deficit. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And... Uh, it doesn't bother me that there's something about God that I don't fully understand yet. And it does, what I don't know about God does not overwhelm what I do know about God. Amen. Amen. I know God's a good God. And here I am after 43 years seeking the Lord, still asking the Lord to reveal himself to me and to show me things. You know, I got a great piece of revelation yesterday morning. And I'm, and, uh, I'm still learning. I'm not going to teach on this, but I'll just tell you real quickly that yesterday morning I was thinking about being led by the Lord and I've always had horses my whole life and I've kind of had the concept that God just wants to speak and say, turn here, go here, do this. And the Lord spoke to me, don't be as a horse or a mule whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle. But you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And the Lord spoke to me and he says, I do not want to control you so that I am controlling everything you do. I want to teach you my way. I want to let you come to know me and then I want you to walk in a way consistent with the direction that I've given you. I don't know if that ministered to you, but that's a, that's a totally different ship. Most people are just, oh, God, take control of me. God doesn't want to control you. He wants to teach you his ways and give you his heart and his understanding, and then you go out and just reproduce that in, consistent with his ways. That's a different thought. And so anyway, I'm still learning. Praise God, I'm still green and growing. And what I don't know is not going to change what I do know. And I know that God's a good God. This needs to be a part of your Christian philosophy. And you need to get to know God personally. You know, it's one thing to say, well, Andrew said, but you need to get to where God said. God has spoken to you. If the things that I'm saying are true, you ought to go and establish a personal relationship with the Lord and spend time and study the Word and understand that through this, you can know the ways of God. This is how you know God. You can know the ways of God. 
This is how you know God is by His ways, by His actions. A person can say anything, but you watch them and that'll tell you who they really are. As he thinks in his heart, that's the way that he really is. And you know what? People can say things about God, but if you would watch God, specifically Jesus. Jesus is the greatest manifestation of God that we've ever had. It says in Hebrews 1, 3 that he's the express image of the Father. That means an, a perfect representation. And you never saw Jesus make one person sick. You never saw Jesus sit there and criticize and hurt people. The only people he ever rejected were the religious Pharisees that trusted in their own goodness. He was merciful to prostitutes, to tax collectors, towards the ungodly. Jesus is the greatest manifestation of who God is that the world has ever seen. And we ought to look at him. And I guarantee you, you cannot sit there and say that Jesus ever just was indifferent. He healed every person that ever came to him, every person that would ever receive. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And that's the nature of God. And you get to know him that way and you filter everything through that. You look at the entire world and every experience that you have through this filter that God, you're a good God. If it's good, it's from God. If it's bad, it's from the devil. And if you looked at the world through that filter, I guarantee you it would make a huge difference and Satan would not be able to tempt us with some of the things that he does. Amen? Amen. I know somebody's sitting there thinking, but wait a minute, so-and-so is quadriplegic in saying that God did this to make them serve him and seek him. And because of that, they are now serving the Lord and this person has led hundreds of thousands of people to the Lord. But you know what? God didn't do that. This one individual I'm thinking about became a quadriplegic because they rebelled at their parents. This is when they were a teenager. Their parents told them not to go somewhere, not to do something. They did it anyway. There was a big sign, no diving here. They dove into a shallow creek, hit their head on a rock, broke their neck. And God didn't do that. There was all kinds of warning signs. God tried to stop them. But when they're laying flat of their back, quadriplegic, they cry out, no, God, I'm sorry for rebelling at you. Turn their life over to God. Now God uses them. But God didn't do that to them. God can take anything. Whatever mess you make of your life, God can take it and work it together for good. But God doesn't cause it. God is a good God. God is not making you quadriplegic giving you something to make you humble. God did not cause your marriage to fail, your business to fail, your health to fail, so that he can teach you something. If you believe that, it makes you susceptible to Satan. And James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The word resist means to actively fight against. You've got to fight against the devil, and if you believe that God's got a part in the negative things happening to you, you won't resist. You'll submit to it. And therefore, Satan will have access to you. I'm looking at Alan and Debbie Moore back there. And if Debbie would have thought for a moment that God is the one that did all of this to Alan, Alan would be dead today. Praise God. Man, she knew God is a good God. And because of that, she was able to stand. Boy, you've got to, you've got to know this or you won't make it. Amen? Isn't that good? Man, Alan's clapping and praising God for Debbie. <laughs> Hallelujah. 